forging cyber, forging cyber security experts. Secure Ninja. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia Webb with Secure Ninja TV. Now, our free preview of Secure Ninja's online Sensei series has generated such a positive reaction that we've decided to give away every single module from this Cyber Kung Fu course, featuring Larry Greenblatt, Tom Upjagrove, and me. If you like what you see and would like to experience a Secure Ninja training course in person at any of our training locations, we have some amazing time-sensitive specials for you. Just visit secureninja.com specials for all of the do not miss deals. And now here is your free module from Cyber Kung Fu for the Certified Ethical Hacker version 8. Enjoy! Alright, welcome back. Module 15, Hacking Wireless Networks. Our objectives are primarily focused on Wi-Fi networks, our 802.11 networks, and how we tried to make them um, virtually private. Now keep in mind with my Ethernet connections, I said if I had physical access to the wire, I could sniff it. Well, um, you always have access to the radio waves if you're in the same area. So we could make it virtually private by using encryption. The first attempt at this, WEP, Wired Equivalent Privacy, very um, poorly written uh, system, uh, they use very small keys and, and there are other issues where you get into them. And, and one of the primary things they did that was really stupid is they used the same key to authenticate as they did to encrypt. So that means everybody who knew the WEP authentication key would know how to decrypt everyone else's data. So WPA, they realized that's not a great idea. Uh, it would be better to authenticate with one key. but. We're going to just generate some random number. Remember our nonces back in um, how password cracking worked. Uh, yeah, I'm going to randomly generate some session key. And that's a lot better, so I can't sniff everybody else, or people can't sniff me. Um, but WPA used, uh, well, RC4 and handled it in such a way that this temporal key that they created, and what they called the temporal key internet protocol, had some issues. And um, when I look at the... Uh, uh, history on this, has TKIP been cracked, um, well, as far back as 2009 in a minute. So let's not use TKIP. Let's go do that same sort of thing. Let's have a session key to encrypt, but we're going to use AES, and that's WPA2. Um, there are also some uh, Bluetooth uh, uh, issues. Uh, now, Bluetooth, the uh, personal area network, only works for so far. Of course, uh, well, my 802.11 is only supposed to work 100 meters and people have gone over 100 miles. Uh, so I don't know. Now, a couple of uh, attacks have come out. Blue jacking, uh, I can send unsolicited messages to you. Uh, it's, it's annoying. Uh, blue snarfing would be much worse. Blue snarfing, and I don't know that anyone's actually got a tool out yet, but blue snarfing, the concept is I could read your information. So that would be very bad. Uh, blue sniffing. Uh, just what it sounds like. And actually they have something called blue smacking, just a denial of service attack. All right, wireless technology as far as Wi-Fi networks started out with uh, the 802.11a standard. 802.11a was able to get 54 megabits per second. But being in the five gigahertz range, now I know this as a musician, the, the higher the frequency, the shorter the distance. So if, if I go to record a band and I sit back uh, too far, I'm only gonna get bass and drums or something. Uh, so these higher frequencies at five gigahertz, I couldn't get it in the far bedroom of my house. So B networks dropped down to the 2.4 gigahertz range where I got better distance. Um, but we had to drop down to 11 megabits per second. Eventually, we got that back up with our Gs. Um, but you know, that 2.4 gigahertz range is really saturated. There's a lot of stuff out there. Um, if I look at a tool at like, um, uh, there's a number of tools that, to see what's, what's outside. And, and this is Insider. Uh, so Insider, I remember the first tool I saw like this was called um, oh, uh, NetStumber. And that summer stopped working for me uh, at Vista, and Insider came out, and I just loved it. So I can look, querying the network with my built-in network card, what other 802.11 systems are here, whether in the uh, 5 or the uh, 2.4 gigahertz range, right? So I, I could go around and take it. Now, this is from things that tell me they're there. What about 
other things that might be there that I can't see. Like, I don't know that a microwave oven would tell me it was there. Actually, I love to show people there's nothing in five either. We gotta get back in five. Two is very saturated, not just with access points, but using a spectrum analyzer, I can actually see other things. So there's obviously way more traffic going on here. And um, this is uh, Channelizer by Metageek. Uh, Channelizer is a great piece of software. Uh, up until Channelizer uh, and their Y-Spy adapter, a, a Spectrum Analyzer, thousands and thousands of dollars. You can get these for uh, as little as $100 for the original one. Uh, this particular one's about $1,000 because it'll, it'll aggregate the um, A and uh, B G and networks. Um, and they also have, pretty neat, uh, some signature databases. So well, if I see a strange wave, you know, I might be able to determine what that is. Pretty cool. Is that an extend camera? We got some perv around here. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, I would not attempt to do uh, wireless network support without having some type of spectrum analyzer out there. Um, so we have to get back on that 5 gigahertz range. There's like nothing there. And a 2.4 gigahertz range is very saturated. Uh, 802.11n will aggregate those channels. Now, I can only tell you the speeds that vendors promise me. I see up to 300 megabits per second by aggregating whatever's available. Um, but the truth is, when this spec came out in September 2009, I was like, all right, how fast does it go? What did they tell me? And the IEEE wants uh, $215 for me to find out. So I'll just go with the vendor's claim. Uh, 802.11i is actually a specification for how to secure your network. So that's Robust Secure Network uh, Association or Access. And RSNI, or actually RSNA, is when I use a radius server to authenticate to uh, the uh, access point as opposed to a pre-shared key. And I use AES uh, to encrypt the data. And we're going to look a little closer. We actually will have to check the integrity and encrypt the data. Um, also, we need to understand how wireless and antennas work. So an antenna like this is omnidirectional. Omni means all, but it's not actually all. It means around in, say, a 360 degree circle, but it, it, it radiates out in, in this way. Now, I can get 100 meters by spec this way, but I can get a more directional antenna. Uh, something like uh, this antenna. Would, would focus it, more of its attention in 180 degrees. So instead of 360, I might get it a little further out. And then I could get a uh, more highly directional, um, it's a direction finding antenna from Metageek that would help me find, um, again, about 180 degrees, but it'll help me find a particular device, maybe rogue infrastructure. But then they can get really concentrated. And um, usually when you're going site to site, you do this. But they've done things like with a Pringles can. And it's amazing. They, they take this uh, Pringles can and it shrinks it down to about 30 degrees. And I, I heard some people tell me, actually, a continent a tomato can works better. But uh, they, with no amplification, if I can get 100 meters at 360, and shrink it down to 30 degrees, that's like 1,200 meters potentially, right? So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I just pointing out to find out what N, how N really uh, fast it went. They wanted uh, 215, or if I remember 170, and I. I've spent so much money on ISO documents, I just can't, ugh, it's hard to justify these things. So some of the, uh, the threats in wireless, uh, people have like default settings. Um, and it used to be like guys like Kevin Mitnick to find default passwords, they go in the, you know, the trash or something, but you just Google for them today. So here's a default password list, and say you found an arrow net. Uh, well, the default uh, admin, you go over HTTP, you don't need a username, and just put in Cisco as a password. So. Uh, pretty easy to set. Um, but also rogue access points. Uh, I often ask people, uh, when I'm teaching at a hotel, I say, how many people here uh, attached to the hotel wireless? And hands go up, I go, are you sure? Sure it wasn't Evil Larry's? You know, because I could set up an access point, say I'm whatever, or Hilton Hotel, and if they have an ethernet, I can pass you into the, uh, into the internet, and I'm doing man in the middle attack. And again, this is because we don't do mutual authentication enough. Very big problem. Um, and if you don't encrypt it or, uh, well, if you do encrypt your traffic, encryption could be broken. Um, but I was talking to, again, one of my favorite hackers in the world is uh, Megumi Takshita. And uh, when WPA2 comes out, she said that she cracks it in an average of three and a half minutes. And I said, oh, now you're talking about WAP. And she said, no, WPA2, Larry said. I said, but that's using AES encryption. So it's a much better protocol. But she said, Larry said, you understand entropy. I don't understand entropy. If you not use random number for passphrase, you do not have the same entropy. And I was like, oh my gosh, 
I said, of course. And not many people use random numbers. In fact, I go to a friend's house and I, and I want to connect with you. I don't know. And they pull out this book and it's whatever Comcast left them with. So you just Google for these things. It's terrible. But even if you did encrypt it, you did it right. And I can't crack it. I can still watch who's talking to who. And you're always vulnerable to traffic analysis. And you're always vulnerable to some type of interference. I get to nano servers by accident because of the microwave oven. Right? So uh, very easy to set that up. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I don't get the opportunity to put a beautiful woman's picture in my slides in and come up with a real reason. So I just had to do this. Um, now, Hedy Lamar, an actress, was uh, listening to a piano player, so the story goes, George Antel, and she had an epiphany. She was thinking, at different times, you're on different frequencies. Now, let's think of how we do multiplexing. Uh, a traffic light does time division multiplexing. It might stay at a red light for a certain point and then it changes. But, say, FM radio uh, does frequency division multiplexing. So in the same radio waves, I get a different uh, station when I go to 93 than if I go to 94. Well, we were worried about Nazis eavesdropping on our radio uh, conversations, and she said, why don't we do that? Why don't we go to different frequencies at different times, kind of like the way your song does? Hedy Lamar and George Anthal have the patent for code division multiplexing access. CDMA, the only multiplexing method I know that provides confidentiality protection, invented by Hedy Lamar. Uh, and I just have this fantasy, I'm George Anthal. I have this theory about radio, and I just want well, to grab this bottle of wine and discuss your little theory. I'm sorry, I was just thinking about that. Uh, but anyway, um, I'd rather use encryption for, for uh, confidentiality today. That frequency hopping, though, is still a good idea. So, uh, and I borrow this from uh, a great uh, wireless engineer for me, uh, Eric Wilet. He wrote Hack Proofing Your Wireless Network. And he said that um, if I wanted to get 100 watts of, uh, of speaker, and he could pull this one because he's a guitarist too, actually much better than I am. Uh, but he said I could get 100 watt speaker, and if it goes down, it goes down. You can't hear it. And the wires are pretty thick. Or I could get 10 10 watt speakers. And I don't have the requirement for such thick wires. I can get, I can get cheaper equipment. And if one of them goes down, you still get 90% of the signal. So frequency hopping or spreading the spectrum across is actually done today for availability. And we use encryption to get confidentiality. But my phone, my uh, Sprint phone, still uses CDMA. I find that pretty amazing. All right, so wireless security, though, I, again, um, I need to know well, first of all, uh, I, I said earlier that you know, in, in LAN protocols, typically, like Ethernet tells me what my cable should look like and what my frame looks like. But in WAN protocols, we like to authenticate who at layer two is trying to get layer one access. Well, the first step is to know the name. Well, the SSID is broadcast out to you. So when I use my, uh, uh, my insider tool, I can see these SSIDs. Now, you could turn that off. You could, you could suppress the SSID. Uh, or excuse me, I'm sorry, look at the security SSID. I can suppress this. So some of these, I don't know who they are. But every time somebody authenticates, that's revealed in clear text. Now, I might not see it with my wireless card, but with my ARP cap card, I could see that. Because, um, as similar, now people get these, these confused. Uh, promiscuous mode lets me sniff traffic that isn't destined to my MAC address. But monitor mode lets me see the lower level uh, radio tap headers. So I might be able to sniff that. And the first tool I know that could do that was Kismet. Actually, Kismet has a version, by the way, Mike Kershaw makes Kismet, and he has a version especially for the ARP cap card. So uh, just hiding your SSID is not really, you know, a, 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 a something that will totally stop people because somebody could find that. Um, all right, so I could also use encryption to both authenticate who's allowed to get on there and encrypt the data. And I said, the ways we've done that with WEP, uh, and it turned out that it was pretty bad. I wonder, did we see any WEP when we were out here? Is that by sewer, by security? Open, open means, and, and this is very common on public network, that there is no authentication, because you know they, they want you at the hotel to be able to get in. They'll have something else, some other authentication to give you actual access to the internet, probably some 802.1x, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But th look, there's some WEP. There's some web. Every time I see web out there, I wonder, is it really out there? 
or is this some honeypot that people want to know? Well, this is a Cisco uh, Linksys. This is a home system. If they didn't change their MAC address, it's very likely this is an insecure system. Uh, is this, is it, I thought they said mom for a second. That's mom's. Yeah, I'm sure that's very secure. Um, so pretty easy to find SSIDs. I could find out whether or not you're using WEP or WPA, WPA2. Let's see. Now I see WPA2 Enterprise and Personal. And the difference is authentication. Enterprise uses a radius server to authenticate. Personal uses a pre-shared key. Now I want to get into uh, how these work specifically. We're going to go into the details here. Um, you may think, or RSNA 802.11i, this is better. But what this does is protect, I don't know how to sniff against enterprise. If you're running enterprise, you're using a radius server. I don't know of anyone that's been able to crack that. If they did, they didn't tell me. Um, that also means I can't run IDS in there. So I might want to be able to sniff my traffic. So it depends on your risk assessment. So you may decide to run personal, even though it's in an enterprise, because you feel you need to do some type of analysis and, and sniff for IDS inside there. All right, do we have any TKIP in here, WPA? Yep, and we still have some TKIP out here. Well, still out there, um, we know that WPA2 replaced TKIP, the temporal, internet, uh, temporal key internet protocol, which uses RC4 with AES. Very important to remember that on the test. Uh, we're driving, I could just take this tool, drive around and, and look for access points. And I don't have to use that tool. Uh, my phone has them. Actually, this cool little app I got, Wi-Fi Faux Fum, uh, correlates with the GPS and gives you a map and stuff and uh, lets you know where other ones are populated. So, a bunch of tools out there to do war driving. All right, uh, WEP, so a little more detail here. It's actually really bad. So I want to show you, uh, in fact, Eric Wallet, I mentioned him earlier, said, um, Larry, I don't think WEP was written this bad on, uh, by accident. He said it had to be the Dilbert principle. Nobody does something this bad by accident. He said the boss got the job, and the engineers just wanted to, we're going to use a bunch of big words, but we're going to get past him with this. So I don't know what happened. So here, here's the way WEP uh, works. Now remember, I have a WEP key. And in WEP, this key is used both to authenticate and encrypt the data. All right. So now, Bob wants to authenticate to this access point. Bob knows the WEP key. The access point knows the WEP key. And Bob says, hi, I'd like to authenticate with you. And they say, okay, but prove to me you know that WEP key by taking this 24-bit number. It's actually called an initialization vector. Be careful. Initialization vectors aren't a bad idea. It's actually to throw off an attack. Um, what happens is, if you think of encryption as, say, I, someone took a, a picture and they, they cut it up into puzzle pieces, right? And you don't have the picture on the box of what it used to look like. So cryptanalysis is trying to put this puzzle back together. Now, you could brute force it. Does this piece go next to this piece? But you probably look for patterns, right? Uh, these are all flat, so they probably go together. They're probably borders. All these green pieces probably go together. So, two ways to do a ciphertext only attack. Right. Right, so, a ciphertext only, uh, I have the ciphertext. I could brute force, we don't like to do that, or I could look for patterns. You know, often hear frequency analysis in text. You know, letter E frequently shows up. Well, one way to throw off that attack is to throw in other pieces that don't go to that puzzle. So, for instance, for every 40 bits of web encrypted data, you get 24 bits of initialization vector of junk. And that's like saying, all right, I gave a guy 100 uh, pieces of a puzzle, but I also threw in a bunch of pieces that don't go to that puzzle. So when they're trying to attack, I wonder where this piece goes. Nowhere, sucker. So initialization vectors were a good idea. 
Uh, 24 bits doesn't give you a lot of randomness, but that's, that's another issue. All right, so now Bob's job is to take this 24-bit initialization vector and encrypt it with that key that he has. And if it decrypts with this key, they know Bob's authenticated. And what did Eve just see? The picture on the box before they cut it into a puzzle, and then the puzzle. You could do a ciphertext only attack through a brute force or pattern recognition, but it is a lot easier to put the puzzle back together when you know the plain text. That's awesome. She knows what it is in plain text, 24 bits, and with 24 bits, this might have been 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. It might have been 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. These are known as weak IVs. A weak initialization vector. 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, something like that. While doing a known plain text attack, she guesses the key. And since that's the key used to encrypt the data, she gets all the data. Bad. What else they did that was really bad? This is awesome. So again, the purpose of the initialization vector, these are pieces that don't go to that puzzle, but they don't know that. And they're trying to confound them. But when they create that packet of data, I said WEP encrypts 40 bits at a time. You get your 40 bits of encrypted data, and you get your 24-bit initialization vector in the same place. That didn't throw off the attacker at all. Instead of throwing it off, Eve just goes, hmm, I wonder what key was used to encrypt this. I wonder if that's the same key to encrypt that. Sounded good on paper, didn't it? So they fixed this. So let's uh, review. WEP, or Wired Equivalent Privacy, uses a, uh, a RC4 40-bit key structure. Now, keep in mind, if DES was considered insecure in 2002 because it only had 56 bits of entropy, how strong could 40 bits of entropy be? Um, it used a 24-bit initialization vector. IVs are a great idea. Again, this is something that's supposed to be a piece of random data that it's really noise for an attacker trying to do that uh, ciphertext analysis and say, I wonder where this piece of the puzzle goes, and oh, it's not part of that puzzle. But there's not a lot of randomness in, in that initialization vector. And they also used it as part of the authentication mechanism. It was the challenge value, so to speak. Um, that's when you use shared queue authentication. You could also do open system authentication in any hotspot environment that, that's uh, you know, common. Then they use something else to authenticate you through an 802.1x, uh, which we'll address in a second here, to control maybe what VLAN you're on and get you out to the internet. Um, and the data encryption used the same key, the same web key that you authenticated with. It never changed. So again, if you knew the web key to authenticate, you could uh, decrypt everyone else's data. So uh, WPA looked at this and said, all right, first of all, let's address the initialization vector issue. We'll make it 48 bits. So that's twice the 24-bit. The and when they put it in the packet, it's in a random place. So that's, that's the way to property is an IV. But their authentication is different. Authentication can use, uh, well, in enterprise mode, you may see that. And I think I, we saw some of that listed out here. Uh, when I, security, we see a bunch of open. But we see a few WPA2 enterprise. And what that means is they're using a radius server to authenticate. Uh, I could use a pre-shared key. But the uh, encryption key is, is a different key. It's a random key now. Um, when they first did it in WPA, they used a 40, or excuse me, a, a, a version of um, a 128 bit of RC4. Their temporal key, it's a, it's a, it's a, a session key, internet protocol has been cracked. In fact, uh, 2009 and under a minute. So we're not going to use that. So in WPA2, we're going to use AES for encryption. Now let's see how that works. And it's important consideration because enterprise, again, might sound like something you want to do if you're in a large environment, but maybe not. So I have an access point that I'm going to both authenticate to and then encrypt data. If I use a pre-shared key, 
Bob knows it. The access point knows it. And everybody else knows it. If I use a radius server, Bob will just authenticate through the radius server and it would be his password, his token device, his biometric, whatever we want to do with uh, the extensible, extensible authentication protocol. All right, so pre-shared key is used to authenticate to the access point, but it's also used as a seed. When I, when I uh, start counting with a number, I call that a seed. Some people might argue it's a salt. That's when I add a number. But this is going to be, I'll call it the seed. It's known as the pairwise master key. Now, when Bob boots up, his station has a MAC address. Um, his station will think of a number. I'll only use once. Random number. The station nonce. The access point has a MAC address. The access point will think of a nonce, a number it will only use once. Just a random number. And then I'm going to hash these. I'll run these through MD5. And we know that MD5 will generate a 128-bit output. This 128-bit output becomes my key. This key is good for this session. It's known as the pairwise transient key. That's a great idea. Now, keep in mind, if everybody in the organization knows the pre-shared key, you'll know the pairwise master key. I don't know your nonces. And I actually learned this because I had uh, my nephew stay at my house. And uh, the web days, I used to be able to sniff. And I wanted to see what these kids are up to. And uh, I moved to WPA2, and I put in the pre-shared key, and I had my Wireshark, and I couldn't snip it. Man. So uh, I wrote one of my favorite hackers in the world, Megumi Takshita, and she said, Oh, Larry, son, you must learn to sniff out EAPOL four-way handshake. That's the extensible authentication protocol over LANs. Let's take a look at what that looks like. So I have Wireshark here. Now, I'm using a card, uh, particularly the Air uh, PCAP card. So remember, promiscuous mode allows me to uh, sniff, sniff all traffic, whether it's to my MAC address or not. But monitor mode allows me to see the lower layer uh, headers, so these 802.11 uh, frames. Right? Now, for one thing, uh, this is how Kismet, another tool you'll, you may need to know for your test, very uh, famous tool, and it was the first I know of that could reveal hidden SSIDs. Well, if I can see these frames, well, sure, there's my SSID revealed right there. So I can sniff that out. Uh, but if I put in the filter, the extensible authentication protocol over LANs, the APOL, and I apply that filter, I can start to see that handshake. And... I was in the middle of it, but when someone authenticates, they send those nonces. So you could see the someone sent a nonce here, but eventually I was able to find the key. And there it is. I sniffed out the PTK, and now I can sniff all the data. And then uh, I, I realized where my nephew was going, and I knocked on the door and I said, uh, what do you think Uncle Larry does for a living? Yeah, I just want to prove to him. I understand these things. So again, uh, the two big takeaways you want to see uh, from WPA versus uh, WEP, they increased the size of the initialization vector, and they made that key a session key, which makes a lot more sense. Don't authenticate with the same key you encrypt. In fact, I remember when these U3 thumb drives came out, and they had an AES, 128-bit ASIC on it. Sounds great. But the key you use to... Uh, authenticate to the device was used to encrypt all the data. They were all vulnerable to some USB sniffing attack and only Iron Key got it right. They were the only ones who knew how to generate a session key. All right, if I use a radius server though to generate the PMK, well that's a nonce for everyone. That's what enterprise is. So again, I'm able to sniff that traffic here because I knew the pre-shared key. If you're using Radius, I don't know anyone yet who's been able to crack that. So, um, I don't know, that might not be what I want to do because I might want to run IDS in there. 
So again, it's called enterprise mode and it suggests that if you're a big enterprise, you want to do this, I say do a risk assessment. It depends on what you want to do. If you need to IDS this, this isn't going to work. So how do they crack it? I understood the pre-shared key. How are people cracking this today? It's not through a weakness in the algorithm. Dictionary attacks on the pre-shared key. So I mentioned earlier, uh, Megumi Takshita told me she cracks WPA2 on an average of three and a half minutes. And it's because people do not provide enough entropy in their pre-shared key. So using Aircrack NG, her favorite uh, Aircrack tool, um, and you're going to need to know command lines on it for the test. Uh, please make sure you look at that section of the book. Read all of your, your official guide uh, book and make sure you understand the uh, syntax for Aircrack NG. Now, another issue was I was able to do it because I rebooted the access point. Well, if I have a card that supports monitor mode, I can speak those low layer 802.11 frames and pretend to be the access point kicking everybody off. And that is known as a de-auth. I'm going to de-authenticate you. So, using a tool like Aircrack, Aircrack NG, I could capture a bunch of these frames play a deauth flood, so to speak, kick everybody off, force them to reauthenticate, eavesdrop on these four values, which you get in the EAPOL four-way handshake. Now, I noticed something on tests, and I, it's not just uh, easy counts. In fact, I don't even know if they get it. But many people think that when you use radius is when you're using EAPOL, not uh, pre-shared key. But actually, we could see I just sniffed it out. It's exactly what happened. And packets don't lie. Uh, the other thing that's important is in how the data is encrypted um, with AES, but how do I check the integrity? So where they had in WPA, they used a message integrity check known as Michael. Uh, that's been cracked, you consider fairly weak. So uh, here we're using AES and Cypher block chaining, a little deep to get into at this module, but it creates a message authentication uh, code. So when you do 802.1i, the assumption is you are, as I say, a client, a wireless node, a supplicant. I supply credentials. I go through an access point, will accept my authentication value and pass it to the authentication server or radius server. And then for data uh, and encryption, I'm using AES in what's known as counter mode. It's a streaming mode of, of uh, a cipher. And for integrity, we use a CBC Mac. All right. As I say, you can sniff this stuff out. How far does um, 802.11 go? I was told uh, 100 meters, but um, in 2005, they were able to get 125 miles without an amplifier, so that's pretty impressive. So, I don't know. Uh, it's kind of interesting. I went to uh, Japan, and Megumi takes me through um, Akihabara. That's uh, their uh, electronic town of Tokyo. And she points out to this uh, adapter. She goes, larry son, this is uh, four times legal strength in the United States. Cannot purchase uh, here. And it was like 70 or so U.S. at that time. Uh, actually, it was $35 on Amazon. So it's, <laughs> you can download this. It's a great, you can use GSKY. It's a chipset. Alpha sells it. But you'll see them for 35 bucks. They are two watts. The one built into my adapter, right, in my laptop, is 250 milliwatts. This thing is two watts. And look at the antennas you get with them. Pretty cool. All right, uh, I also use a tool called YSpy. It's a spectrum analyzer, and we looked at it a little earlier. So you're not just looking for uh, other radio devices. If you're trying to set up, you know, I, I'm always thinking as the operator. I'm not necessarily trying to hack. I want this thing to work. And you're doing a site survey. You want to make sure you're not interfering with something else. So I would not try to run a network without a spectrum analyzer. Uh, wireless cards and capabilities, if you're going to be working in this field, you do need to have a card. And there's my train, baby. They know I love trains, they're doing it for me. Uh, monitor mode, again, is the ability to, to go into a, a lower level and see the 802.11 headers and possibly even inject them. That's known as packet injection. If I'm going to do the deauth flood that we spoke about, I'm going to need to be able to do monitor mode. The GSK line card does that as well, and it works with backtrack. So it's a very popular card with hackers. Promiscuous mode, again, means that I, can, I, I will listen to uh, multiple uh, or anyone's MAC address, not just things destined for mine. And what's nice about these cards, I, I have a, um, a graphic here. You can see that they actually, I can aggregate uh, uh, the channels. So I can actually plug three in at once, and I could have one listen on channel one, channel six, channel 11. Really cool. 
Wireshark this year gave us the ability to capture on multiple interfaces anyway, so you could probably triple that, right? Um, Cascade Pilot, I would use more for just scanning and, and, and analyzing charting. And most of the time, I can't stare at my network with a, a protocol analyzer. I look at a statistics gatherer. Who are the top talkers? What are the top protocols? Um, but then when there's something looks suspicious, then I can drill into that. Kismet, um, with the first tool I know of, and definitely testable, uh, t that can help you find hidden SSIDs. Uh, and then you're going to use a number of tools. In your suite, you have Aircrack NG and Cane Enable will allow you to do web cracking. Uh, Aircrack NG, most of my friends tell me that's their uh, tool of choice for this. All right, uh, we sniffed this out before in EAP. Well, here's a, a screenshot for uh, Aircrack NG, and you can see advanced options. I could uh, do some uh, deauth floods. Um, there's air uh, dump, air NG, there's an air play that's not visible here that allows you to play those, those things. And then it also do your, your password crack. So again, we're not cracking uh, WPA so much as we're cracking the, the password. So uh, keep in mind that crack is when you're not getting the entropy you think you are. So DES was never really cracked. DES has 56 bits of entropy and as far as I know, it does. But we can brute force that now. Oh, it would have taken trillions of years, but in today's computing, I think it's uh, probably close to about a second. Um, but uh, E0, used in Bluetooth, which we're going to discuss here. While E0, the algorithm, I don't know, is testable for the test. It really worries me. E0 is supposed to be 128-bit uh, uh, cipher, meaning I should get 128 bits of entropy. But it's very vulnerable to the known plain text attack. So that's when I saw the picture on the box before it was encrypted and afterward. So I've heard numbers of like, if I had maybe an hour's worth of conversation and I heard you say it and then I saw the data, it's about 38 bits of entropy. That's pretty scary. All right, uh, another tool that I really love for wireless analysis, um, IPA will also use your, uh, your air PCAP adapter and uh, really help you diagnose performance issues like why am I going out, so, you know, getting so um, only two megabits per second at this place, where are some of the, the traffic going, is it too much broadcast, is it other people trying to associate with me. And Ryan Woodings, who uh, runs MetaGeek, uh, uh, I, I know him, I, I, and I asked him, could you please put some layer one IDS in there? He's like, well, layer one. Now, Tom and I got to meet a, a guy who said that um, he, you don't have to always look at, at a, a packet's uh, contents. In, in fact, he said, if you just look at an, a sine wave of communication, normal business versus attacks, they look different. And Ryan said he loved it. So uh, we're going to be meeting again the, uh, this, June, uh, this month. So hopefully I'll be able to uh, see some more work get done on that. Awesome. All right, um, Alicia, any questions? Now, Larry, you mentioned antennas. What kind of antennas are used for war driving? Well, it depends. Now, typically when you start, you want an omnidirectional antenna, so it's going to pick things up in a wider range. But if you're trying to particularly focus on an area, and once you know, hey, there's something a lot in that apartment building, so from here, let me get a more directional antenna. And you can get a Yagi antenna, like the people have done it with a Pringles can, uh, that shrinks it down to about 30 degrees, so really focusing and getting you a lot more range. Wow. Um, now, what about cards? What are the best cards to use? Well, it depends on your, your budget. So, I'm a big fan of the Air PCAP cards, but uh, I know many people will tell me they have everything done with this. In fact, you can, I, I just checked on Amazon. You can get this card. Um, it's the one that Megumi basically showed me in Japan. It's currently $36. It comes with, look at the size of this antenna, and they generally come with a, uh, also a parabolic antenna uh, as well, which will give me a, a a better range in a narrower field um, for 35 bucks and it does the two things we need we need monitor mode and we need promiscuous mode and it works with backtrack so very very popular okay. awesome. now we hope you've enjoyed this free module but there's lots more the cyber kung fu course has 29 videos in all and will really help build you a solid understanding of the ceh version 8 curriculum don't forget, if you prefer to attend one of Secure Ninja's courses in person at any of our training locations, you really need to visit secureninja.com slash specials for some amazing discounts and other deals. I'm Alicia Webb. Happy training. Secure Ninja TV is brought to you by secureninja.com, a world leader in cybersecurity training and certification. Our master instructors will help build you into a highly skilled and marketable security professional. Secure Ninja, forging cybersecurity experts.